All right, welcome to another edition of the uh, virtual uh, uh, spine uh, group. Is can everyone see uh, the correct screen on mine? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Well, I'm going to be quick with my introduction here uh, because I'm kind of still gaining my voice back. But I think we have a great uh, talk here tonight. Uh, we're joined by folks that are uh, in or near. Uh, in, in fellowship or a recently completed fellowship, and we're going to talk about navigating uh, spine fellowship. Uh, this has been uh, uh, something I've been interested in talking about and um, uh, talking to my mentors. Uh, current fellow, uh, Dr. Peters, uh, really uh, got me back on track to talking about this again. So let me uh, go through some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight, and then we will move on to hear from uh, Dr. Leroy, one of our current fellows, uh, and then we'll transition to, to Dr. Peters, uh, Dr. Shuba's current fellow, and then we'll finish up uh, with Dr. Nimmons, who is a former fellow, who's probably going to talk a little bit more about uh, transitioning uh, to work and life beyond fellowship. So here was my, my path to fellowship. You know, I was a student at Cornell uh, and then a resident in orthopedics uh, at Utah. Uh, you see the Utah uh, faculty there. And I got very interested in, in uh, spinal tumors. And um, I debated doing two fellowships, uh, one in uh, the spine and one in oncology, in orthopedic oncology. Uh, but I was essentially advised that that was probably not the ideal approach. In fact, Matt Coleman, uh, whose picture you see here, uh, was uh, one, of the, one of the fellows I met when I was a resident uh, doing a similar path. And uh, you know, he said you can do a uh, you can do a spine fellowship and not do a lot of tumors depending on where you are, and you can do a tumor fellowship and, and really never work on the spine. And so he said you're probably better off working one on one with somebody that does a lot of spinal tumors. Uh, and in fact, that was also the recommendation of of Dr. Brodkey and uh, Lawrence and Spiker at, at Utah as well, and they knew Dr. Shuba uh, pretty well at that time and recommended I. Uh, go work with him for a year for my uh, fellowship, which is what I did. And of course, now I'm at uh, WashU. And so here's uh, uh, Dan Shuba, uh, my uh, fellowship mentor, not to be confused with Dan Hurley, shown here next to him, who just won a national championship with UConn, although I'm convinced they're the same person. Uh, and, you know, when you're looking at your fellowship, I think Dr. Leroy is going to talk a little more about uh, picking a fellowship, but you really want to think about um, you really want to think about your interest, uh, and you also want to think about your style of learning. Uh, and I think there's, uh, on both sides, uh, some room for flexibility uh, that you may or may not think about beforehand. So in my case, uh, very interested in spinal tumors. Um, and also, I'd say my style is I very much like being in a mentorship model uh, where it's where it's one-on-one, -on -one, uh, working with somebody. Uh, and so this uh, year for me was, was really the ideal uh, situation. Uh, you know, just a few pearls for me before I turn it over, uh, things I learned during my year in fellowship. Um, you know, it's only one year uh, for neurosurgery or for ortho, typically. Uh, and so you really want to take advantage of everything. And, um, you know, it's easy to say before and easy to say after. And sometimes it's harder during the year when you're tired and you're just working your tail off the whole time. Uh, but I remember even in that year, I uh, explained, you know, to my spouse, like, hey, this year I'm going to do everything I can to be in every case, uh, learn everything I can, because then I'm on my own. Uh, and in fact, you know, I talk a lot about uh, work-life balance and, and things that I think are probably important. Uh, but I remember my son, <laughs> who was young and during that year, saying he knew that if the phone rang and I said, Shuba, uh, that I was going to take the call and probably go to the hospital. <laughs> so... Um, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, I think it helps to take notes during that year um, and to really pay attention uh, because you're going to you're going to notice when you finish the year, you're going to be in positions that first year is an attending. And it's amazing uh, how many times you fall back on something you saw in fellowship or you did in fellowship. Uh, and so having some having some notes during the year actually helps you kind of learn what you're doing a little better, I think. Uh, and then uh, if you forget something, you can always look back and say, oh, yeah, we use this for that or that's what we did during this. Uh, but certainly paying attention and, and really soaking in as much as you can. You know, you're probably going to know your mentor or mentors longer than a year. Uh, so you really want to invest in that year. Uh, Broadkey would always talk about how fellowship is really a 
kind of multi-year process, even though we say it's one year. And so it's the year before getting set up, getting to know them. It's the year of fellowship. And then it's the years after where you're new in practice and you're still running cases by them, trying to figure out uh, uh, what you're doing. And so uh, here's just a few pictures from 2019 to this year uh, at the top of the mountain at Banff. Uh, where we have the uh, the Spine Fellows Retreat. And you can see, you know, Shuba and I are, are in every picture. Uh, who's there has changed a little bit. You've seen the last one, my wife's there. Uh, the first one, uh, Brandon Lawrence from Utah was there. But, um, uh, but you know, we, we, do, we, we do this every year when, and, you know, still are friends to this day. So uh, it's likely you're going to know your mentor for a long time or mentors for a long time uh, because you, you, you share that year together. A few more things that I learned from uh, that I feel like I've taken with me, you know, ortho and neuro are very different residencies, and I think that's okay. I think uh, I don't think we're that close to combining them into one spine field or one spine uh, residency. Uh, you know, I think we might be getting closer to maybe the idea of a spine boards or something like that where we're combined. Um, but I think it's great that we have the different residencies because we both bring both groups bring something to the table. Uh, and I think um, that's one of the things I learned uh, uh, being with the neurosurgery folks at Hopkins is that things are slightly different and that's that's actually good. You can learn a lot from that. Uh, one, you know, one of the things I remember is uh, early on getting frustrated with some of the residents because I felt like the exams were not uh, precise enough uh, on some of the uh, trauma calls when we were on call. And I remember the first couple of nights, they'd say things like moving all four extremities. And I'd say like, well, yeah, but what's the exam? And they might say, well, yeah, they're strong and their uppers and lowers. And I, you know, I was used to the orthopedic exam, which is you get a call and it's, you know, they always air the other way where it's so much you're like, what are you saying? Where it's, you know, they're, they're four plus here and they're five minus there and you're trying to, and I realized when I went to the first M&M &M, uh, in neurosurgery that you know, priorities are a little different. They're dealing with usually uh, brain and, and spinal cord injuries. And so a lot of what they're dealing with is, are they dead or not dead, right? Uh, and uh, uh, in orthopedics, it's it's a lot of times the opposite, right? It's it's fixing fractures, it's non-unions, it's joint replacement. And so there was just a different, a different approach, uh, which I thought was really interesting and, and actually learned a lot from them uh, and how they dealt with a lot of those things. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Shuba and Dr. Molina. Dr. Molina is my partner here uh, at WashU now in the neurosurgery department. And uh, he was finishing the fellowship year as an infolded fellow when I was starting it. Uh, and so uh, it's been fantastic to have him here as a partner, uh, again, with our, our shared experience uh, in the past uh, being the Shuba fellow. Uh, you know, the other thing I learned from Shuba and fellowship is to try to learn from every service and every experience. And so if you're around Shuba a lot, you'll notice that when he talks to other services, whether it's anesthesia, whether it's ENT, he's always kind of picking their brain, you know, asking them about what they do for different things with esophageal tears or whatever it is that that he's talking to them about. He's always learning from them uh, and, and really has built up a, a, a wealth of, of knowledge uh, because of that approach. I think one of the things he stressed in that year was to always do things right. And, um, you know, he, I think the data would say that running two rooms is fine. Um, we typically did not do that. I typically don't do it here unless it has to be done for trauma or something. Um, but he was very much uh, uh, focused on doing things right. Whether that took an extra hour or not, he didn't care. Uh, he said, you know, you want to do the right thing all the time for these patients. And, uh, and he was very passionate about that. And, you know, he talked about how people know who take good care of people. And he'd always say, you know, it's a real privilege to take care of anyone in the hospital, but, you know, an employee, uh, a nurse on the floor, their mom, uh, because it means that people are learning about your work and that they trust you to take good care of them. If there is a complication, which depending on your field, there, there, there will be, um, you know, he always talked about being honest, uh, talking to the family uh, about uh, what the complication is. And then he'd always, you know, give the analogy of saying, you know, if you have a complication, you know, that patient's now right here and he put his arm out like they're you're their best friend. You're rounding on them twice a day. You know, you're asking him what else you can do. You're making sure that, uh, you know, that things are the best they can be after that complication uh, because it's your complication. And uh, he, he drove that point home once when uh, I saw him in the morning. And uh, uh, he asked how a patient was 
And uh, I don't even remember what the complication was, but uh, I said, oh, I haven't seen him yet. Because at that point, I don't know if it was a meeting or what. I, I typically hadn't rounded on his people. It was early. And uh, I usually did it right after that. And he said, oh, she's doing fine. I just saw her. And his point was, hey, I'm, I'm, even though I'm the attending, I'm going to be here if there's a complication early, seeing people, making sure things are, are okay. Also learned a lot from just paying attention to how he works in terms of learning the politics of meetings, uh, negotiations, relationships, and of course, uh, numerous, uh, too numerous to list uh, the clinical pearls uh, that, that, that I learned that year. So uh, enough about me and my path. I think uh, we should get on with uh, uh, the rest of our panel here. Um, we're gonna lead off with uh, Dr. Uh, Leroy, who I said uh, is one of our fellows now. Um, she's going to be moving on to uh, New England Baptist uh, and Tufts. And uh, I just put a little one liner up here. I think about some of these folks. You know, I was telling my wife about the fellows, and I said, you know, Taryn does all the things you want fellows to do without ever being asked. So if you have a case going and you're saying, is this bed there? Are they in the room? She'd be in the room all over it. Everything be ready. Uh, all, all the things you want uh, fellows to do. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. Peters after that. He's, uh, like I said, currently completing uh, the uh, Dan Shuba Fellowship, uh, so to speak, and then we'll be at uh, UMass Neurosurgery, so uh, looking forward to the neurosurgical perspective. And then we'll uh, finish up with Dr. Nimmons, who was a fellow here and is now uh, out uh, uh, helping the world uh, on his own. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over uh, to Dr. Leroy here. All right, hopefully everyone can see my slides here. But like Dr. Goodwin said, I am Dr. Leroy and I am excited to be here to talk a little bit about first deciding how to become a spine fellow and making that decision and then throughout the year and the su successes I've had throughout this year. Uh, let's see. So for me, my a little bit about my background. So I'm a what we would call a Boston and New England lifer. So I went to Tufts for medical school. I was at Tufts for residency and I decided to leave Massachusetts to head to Missouri for the year. So I'm currently a WashU Spine Fellow. And then next year I'll be heading back to New England Baptist, like Dr. Goodwin said, and I'll be a part of the Tufts residency program. And my main focus is on adult spinal deformity, hopefully. I think one of the biggest questions that a lot of people have asked and a lot of my former co-residents were, how do you even choose a fellowship? So I thought it would be helpful to kind of consider, especially for spine, some of the things that I thought about when I was making the decision. And I think ultimately you can pick any fellowship. There's no one fellowship for all people. It's the best fellowship for you. And so I think this making a decision about where to go for fellowship, you really have to reflect on what you value and what you're hoping to get out of your experience. So things that I thought about, and I had a checklist were whether the number of attendings that were at a certain fellowship if you have too many attendings, you might not be able to get that true mentorship model. If you have too few, you might not be able to get a breadth of different experiences and different surgical techniques, the number of fellows that you'll be working with, the amount of autonomy you'll have, whether you're interested in deformity, which is what I was incredibly interested in, which is why I chose WashU, versus if you want a more MIS or endoscopic experience. And then another thing that's really important about a fellowship is whether there's freehand technique versus robotics versus navigation, what is your primary form of training? And, and really you need to think about what you want in your experience. And then what your trauma burden is, if you're interested in trauma and what, if you're interested in taking a lot of call or if you don't want it. For me, I was really interested in it because I wanted that exposure and that autonomy, especially at WashU, being able to do cases on our own with our co-fellow. And so that was an important part to me. And then whether the research opportunities during your year, the didactics and the fellowship education outside of being in the OR, and then I think the location. These are things that I found to be important or things I thought about. And so for me, the biggest things were autonomy and deformity exposure. And so that's why WashU was my number one for fellowship. But every person is different. I just think these are the things that I thought about when I was making the decision. And then I was looking back on what I was thinking about as I started the year. And I think the first and foremost is be nice. It goes so far and I can see it, you know, throughout residency and throughout training, like the people who are nice nurses now, you know, they're, they come to them, the room runs differently. And 
it's people are more willing to help you. And so it should go without saying, but I've found that that's really the, one of the biggest things that makes the successful start of your year. And I think the start of your practice, I think for me, the whole goal is, you know, come to learn, being really enthusiastic from the beginning, you got to be teachable as well. But I think it's also an opportunity as a fellow to be able to start teaching yourself because depending on the practice you're going into, you'll maybe be teaching residents, you might be teaching your PA. So you're always going to be a teacher as a person in surgery. So I think you need to be teachable, but you also need to be starting to kind of develop your own teaching style and your own teaching practice during the year. I think something I got a lot of feedback on in terms of like suggestions for my own starting a fellowship is people always say, don't say like at my residency, we did this. It's one year for you to learn other techniques, other ways of thought. And so really soaking what everyone else is saying in is really important rather than you being like, well, this is what I did in residency. So this is what I should be doing in fellowship more just taking every opportunity and seeing all the experiences. And then you can kind of formulate your own style next year, moving forward. I think, like I said before, participate, be engaged. I really do think first impressions matter and you're not, no one knows you in that first start of the year. And so you go from being this person, a chief at your residency program, like the big guy or gal, and then you enter fellowship and, and you aren't, you're not known. So I think first impressions really matter and really goes back to being a nice and kind and friendly person really will set you up for success. Another thing is really starting your research projects early, depending on where you are in fellowship. Some institutions have a really strong research setup and a research foundation, so you can get a lot done. Others, it might be a little bit harder. So you definitely want to start it like from the get-go month one, and then be assertive you know, take action on your own fellowship. This is your year to learn everything you possibly can. So you put in, like you'll get out what you put into the year. And then resources. So these are specific things I was thinking about, you know, who can help you get through this year and beyond. And so obviously it's your residency mentors, your fellowship mentors. I think your co-fellows, you know, those are people you can really lean on throughout the year. And then Scott's here on the on the zoom as well, but like going to your previous fellows, like how did this year go for you tips and tricks for getting through the start of the year? You know, there's countless textbooks, there's countless journals. AO spine gives you the fellowship reading list, which I found invaluable in the beginning of the year. And then this other book that I found actually that I found to be so helpful throughout this year was 50 landmark papers. Every spine surgeon should know. So I got that at the beginning of the year to kind of give me a foundation for how to start my fellowship. And then of course, industry with their different courses and all the different spine societies, there's countless different societies you can join, meetings to attend. So there's just unlimited resources and it's seeking out what works for you. And then reflecting on succeeding in fellowship. So I obviously still have a couple months left, but these are things that I've thought about throughout the year. So of course, networking is really important, whether you're going to courses, introducing yourself, meeting people, shaking hands, um, networking within your hospital too, right? So these are your colleagues for life, whether you leave that place or not. I'm um, just, you know, constantly keeping those relationships open and then uh, online, like such as something like this, where you're able to get yourself out there and meet other people, whether in person or on Zoom. And then I think for succeeding in fellowship too, you need to review what went well and what didn't after your cases. So kind of taking notice of, okay, like that move that your attending did worked really well. Let me make sure I know that or that didn't work as well. Like that was a little bit inefficient. So taking note of that. So in next year, you're kind of going through the same thing, you know, like, okay, like that part definitely didn't work for this case. And I think I've definitely taken a lot of notes and made comments about certain successes or failures of different cases. Well, after each case that I've done, and I think midway through fellowship. So right now we're getting towards the end. I've started to kind of review my case deficiencies, like what I haven't done yet, what I still want to see so that I know in the next four months that I can definitely see those things because next year I'll be on my own and they may come into my door and I won't have seen it in fellowship. And so I think that's definitely something to take time to reflect on yourself and your own training and kind of knowing your strengths and weaknesses throughout the year. And then I also think just connecting with your mentors, setting up meetings with your attendings, whether it's grabbing coffee after a case and just staying connected with them because these are you know, I would say all my attendings at WashU are going to be people I'm going to be connected with for life. And so just keeping those connections because you never know what will happen in the future. And then other things I've been thinking about now that I'm trying to like prepare for my job, I'm just, you know, getting all my meetings set up for the start of next year. 
So I've obviously been taking notes. I've been jotting down attending steps. So obviously at our fellowship, we have a kind of a fellow fellow handbook that has all the different attending steps and tips and tricks for different attending. So if your fellowship has that, it's amazing. Or if you could create it, it'd be great to pass down for other fellows in the future. I think thinking, preparing for every case as it was yours next year. So just attending the AO Spine BAMP Fellows course, we were talking about thinking about every possible complication that could happen, thinking about what you would do if that complication happened, and then just thinking and preparing for next year, like how people pre-op plan, how people interop set up, where they put the bed, where they put the lights, the things you kind of forget. And I know next year I'll be by myself and, and be like, oh God, I forgot what they did there. How did they make that so successful? So taking pictures, I plan to do towards the end of the year. And then collecting note templates, so clinic notes, OR notes, discharge instructions, all these things that you have now, I've started to save them now and I have them in a file so that next year I can get the ball running well. And then collecting all OR instrumentation trays from the OR staff, so I have all the trays that all the different attendings use. And then my last slide is obviously about finding a job. So starting the year, keeping your CV up to date, having a kind of a base, base cover letter that you can use and pass on. Um, and kind of uh, personalized for each different place you're hoping to interview at. I started the process early, so I started when I was a chief, but I was told repeatedly not to sign before fellowship because I didn't know what would happen when I came to Wash U. And I had never left Massachusetts, so I didn't know if maybe leaving and going to Missouri, I didn't realize I wanted to try and live somewhere else. So I think starting it earlier, the better, gives you more options, gives you more opportunity. But I think you never really know what's going to happen when you start fellowship and things can change after a few months. So I think that that advice really worked for me and it solidified why I did want to go back home to Boston, but I wasn't sure in the beginning. I also, you know, people say to interview at numerous places, like send different interviews, you know, apply to academic, apply to private. You don't really know what the best job is and you if you, you know, limit yourself, you might not, you might've missed something. So I think keeping options open, trying to interview at academic and at private, I think will just make you feel more solid in your decision and why you chose what you chose for your job. And then of course, fellowship mentors. So at Wash U, like people get emails constantly. We were receiving emails, like this place is looking for a job. This is looking for a job. So my fellow, this fellowship year has been amazing and the support in that. And then I also think sales reps know a lot. So if you want to go to a certain place, like certain sales reps might actually know of jobs before they're ever published. And then of course we have the NAS, they have the job board on NAS's website. And then AAAOS also has a job board. Those often, you know, maybe aren't as up to date or those jobs might already be taken, but it is a resource if you're kind of like just trying to figure it out and start the process. And that's really all I have on my part. And thank you for letting me join in. Sarah, that was awesome. Um, while Dr. Peters gets set up here, <laughs> I I loved your comment to be nice. Um, I, I as a person that came from the Northeast, how did you find transitioning from the kind of Northeast OR culture to the Midwest OR culture? Well, I guess it felt similar. I think what I realized is that no one knows you though, so you can't. So you're kind of a little, not like walking on eggshells in the beginning, but you're trying to like get to know everyone's personalities. And I just found that I sort of was a, maybe a bit more reserved for my first month because I just wanted people to get to know me. No one really knows me. They don't know what my experience is. And so that's why I was just like, let me just be nice to everyone, which I normally am anyway. <laughs> but um, Luckily it wasn't the, tra the personalities. Luckily I trained at a pretty nice and friendly place. And I think the same is held true here. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good advice. I also like your advice to think about every complication. I um, recently was talking to a pilot about their training and uh, the differences since we're always compared to aviation. It was, it was a spine surgeon who was, who was a pilot. And one of the things he said is that when you're training, you would never be allowed whatever was in the cockpit or wherever you know you never be allowed to be in, be there without having basically memorized the list of complications that could happen on the flight and what the answers are how you're going to troubleshoot it um and so i you know I, I guess part of the problem with us doing that is that maybe we don't have the maybe we don't all have quite the same answer for how we handle some of the things but i uh, certainly agree 100 percent going through every, I still do it, going through every possible thing that could pop, that could go wrong for the case mm -hmm. and saying, okay, if I lose motor data, 
uh, during this part of the case, what am I going to do? And, and of course, for that, we have sheets to go by if you want. But, you know, thinking through all those things, because uh, when it happens, especially when it happens for the first time and you're new attending, it's stressful. I mean, it's always stressful, but it's stressful because it's happening to you now. It's your decision. So certainly having gone through that uh, uh, numerous times before, particularly for big cases or complex cases, uh, is, is very helpful. Um, the only thing I want to mention is that when you, uh, well, let's, let's move on so I don't take up all the time. I have one more comment that will probably be mentioned. So we'll transition to uh, Dr. Peters here. I uh, let him uh, get going. Uh, well, so I'll, first I'll say, you guys can see my screen, is that? Yes. Good? All right, Perfect. thanks. Dr. Loy, great job. I'm like so happy that you'd be about like 45 minutes away so I can like come steal all the notes you took and everything. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I hope too much of this isn't uh, repetitive. Um, but I, it's, it's, a, it's shocking how, how much, like, I have like the same, you'll see the same lines in both, uh, Dr. Goodwin's and, and your, and your talk. Um, so, uh, I am also Northeast born and raised, uh, up in Rochester, New York. I went to med school down in Texas and then went back up to Rochester for my neurosurgery residency. Uh, and through there, I got in touch with Dr. Shuba. So I am, uh, like I said, the complex spine spinal ecology fellow up in at Northwell now. Um, and uh, basically, I'm just going to run through how I thought of things from during residency until, you know, now and, and, and going forward. So hopefully that's hopefully it's a little helpful, at least. So here's my my one disclosure is I have no idea what I'm doing. Still, sometimes it feels like uh, I'm still figuring it out. And and I talk to people all the time. And and notably, I will say I uh, when uh, Dr. Goodwin asked me to to do this, I, I texted a bunch of the fellows that I know around not only here, but the country to say, what should I say? What did like, and, and honestly, everyone is saying the same thing. And so um, I tried to make sure that I highlighted those little pearls in, in, in a generic way. Um, so this is pre-navigating fellowship. Uh, I Like I said, Dr. Roy, I think you did a great job highlighting this, so I won't go over this too much. But for me, it was you know, spine versus cranial. Um, and I, I wanted to decide as early as possible, but I, but I, I went in thinking I was going to do epilepsy, then I went to vascular and then eventually settled on spine, uh, which, so, so there's a path, there's a path to take. And I, I will say, I didn't decide super early, but, but uh, as early as possible. And then once you do figure out what you want to do, uh, specifically in spine deformity, pediatrics, oncology, which is what it was for me uh, and Dr. Goodwin, uh, trauma, degenerative, MIS, whatever. And, you know, figure out how specialized does your knowledge need to be, you know, do I, I, I in neurosurgery residency, at least like 60, 70% of my cases were spine already. So I, you know, the, the kind of the basic stuff I had, and, and I wanted to really focus um, on, on oncology specifically. Um, so based on that, I wanted to go find a mentor and discuss. Uh, I, I had as many mentors as I could possibly get some much closer, obviously, than others, uh, both fresh and uh, fresh out of out of residency or fellowship and and some seasoned ones. Um, and I will say one of the main ones that I had wasn't even a spine mentor, uh, but it was a actually a a guy that uh, uh, went through neurosurgery residency at Hopkins and he's the one that actually put me in touch with Dr. Shuba. Um, had a great time working with him and 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 uh, was able to offer that help to me. Um, so you know, reach out, find out anybody you can. Um, and then once you get there, reach out to those whom you with whom you have interest in working. So um, I obviously got in touch with Dr. Shuba as early as possible, but I also reached out to some other people around the country that were doing spine, spine tumors to see if, you know, just to kind of bother them and say, hey, you know, are you looking for somebody? Can I, can you consider me? Can we talk? Whatever. Can you give me any advice on finding a spot? Uh, everyone always says research helps. Do research, research, research. Uh, I, I did a bit, uh, but I but like I was mentioning before, I did a fair amount that wasn't in uh, a spine. Even I did some brain tumor stuff, some vascular. So, just having that, uh, being able to show that you can produce things, get things out, whether or not it's in your field uh, specifically right away is 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 for, I, I thought wasn't necessarily uh, necessary. Um, but later after, after I figured this out, I started to focus a bit more. So from pre-navigating fellowship to navigating pre-fellowship, uh, once you kind of figure out what you want to do, again, not to harp on my own experience, but this is obviously what I know, uh, which mine was spine oncology. You want to focus on that topic, um, both research and clinical, not so much at the expense of, I didn't do anything else, obviously, because I, you know, in practice, I'm going to have to do a variety of things. I, I have to take general neurosurgery call. 
Um, and frequently people, I know frequently ortho uh, surgeons have to take general ortho call, uh, even if they're spine focused, some of my friends have had to do that. Um, so, so learn everything, but focus, you know, have a sub focus on what you want to do. Uh, I tried to do, I did try to do every spine tumor case that came through my residency for what it's worth. Um, and then most importantly, this is, I, I think the, the number one thing I can say in my, in my talk is think about what you want from the future. So from the remainder of your residency, but also from your fellowship, uh, some advice that I got from, uh, the same guy that put me in touch with Dr. Shuba was you don't necessarily want to do as many cases as possible. He said, I'd rather do 150 cases that I really, really want to do that are big and I can learn well, you know, something from each one of them, then do 500 cases, uh, like, you know, 500 ACDFs. And not that, you, you know, you can learn a lot from every ACDF, but, but you know, focus on the, take, do the 150 that, that really are, are, are in your wheelhouse, in your niche and what you want to learn. Um, and, you know, obviously what you want in terms of research, as well. So if you know, one of your goals is to learn how to set up a database so that you can be productive in the future, kind of have that outlined in your mind uh, was the advice that I was given. And, and, I, and I did that specifically when I got here. Um, and then this last line is one is one that every fellow that I did text, texted back to me was and, and also was in uh, your your talk earlier, Taryn, it was uh, prep yourself to become an attending without being attending. These are this is the last time you are practicing under somebody else's license for what it's worth and be the attending on these cases prep know everything about these cases um, um you're not the attending yet but you should act like it you should you should see the patient in the clinic and take them all the way through till post-op and, and and know everything about them like you are the attending uh so in terms of the fellowship i broke it up into the into quarters in my mind um so when you start i think you as has been said again, realize you're starting over. Uh, that took me a bit to walk in, and I was like, I I've been you know operating somewhat independently for the past couple of years, and now and now you guys think that I you're like haven't seen me operate. So you're like, well, let me see what you can do. Um, uh, and that's and that's good. That's how it should be for sure. Um, but you know, go to clinic. We didn't have a lot of clinic specifically in our residency, so I, I go to clinic and I as much as I can to kind of learn how to talk to patients. Like, for instance, if you're doing a sacrectomy on somebody that's relatively preserved and normal, you know, how do you talk to them and say, after this, you uh, are going to probably not have bowel or bladder function for months to a year to maybe forever, you know, depending on where it is, um, that little pain you had was something really bad, but we can hopefully take care of it, but it's going to be at a cost. Um, uh, when you start, meet everyone, make them all your friend. Uh, that is so, so can you be nice to everybody? I also think that I am pretty nice when I, when I go talk to people, but, but, you know, maybe put on, do a little bit extra when you start. It is, uh, fellowship, I think is, is, is gaining knowledge from a fire hose. And so you have, you need those friends to learn from, um, read, as much as possible. Again, those lists, I, I should have put up little pictures of the lists also. That would have been, uh, that was that was a good idea, but uh, I didn't, but those lists are amazing. Just try and learn everything you can um, from them. Be prepared, take notes. That's that's so key. So before every case, you know, sit down. I, I, I try and sit again, if they're, you know, 12 hour cases, I'd sit down for a long time the night before. And I say, okay, this is what I would do step one. This is what I do step two. This is what I do step three. Uh, and full disclosure, I stole that from, from Dr. Shuba. He writes it everything out on a little whiteboard during every case. And, and so now I, you know, take a piece of paper and pretend it's my whiteboard. And I say, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And then I try and compare it the next day. Um, I'm a terrible artist, but I draw all the tumors that I can. Um, sometimes people are like, what is the squiggle you made? But it, whatever, either way. Uh, when you start, you you should also start looking for jobs right away. I, th I think, and I, I heard that from another fellow too. But I'm not saying you should you should sign right away, but start getting your name out there. Um, uh, agreed that you should you know try and interview as many places as possible. I, I, I try to do that for sure. Um, but start looking. Uh, middle fellowship part one. So the second or the second three months, um, the early middle months, that is when you're settling in. I uh, work on whatever you thought was important in your in your pre fellowship like residency when you when you set that goals work on that at this part at this point. Um, I I think that the, one of the most shocking things to me was how much time I thought I'd have in the beginning of the year versus how much time I have now. 
and that and and I have not written as much as I wanted to. I, I I've written a fair amount. Um, I have a lot of things right on the doorstep that are ready to go out, but I wish I had had more that were out. And, and I mean, I have gotten a few things out for what it's worth, but um, right because it goes faster than you think. Um, and this is where I started maybe a little bit earlier this, but this is where I started talking uh, to Dr. Shuba about helping me out more with jobs. Uh, I, I as we as we progressed in our mentor uh, mentee relationship. Um, and I'm, I'm not actually giving enough credit to Dr. Lowe, who helped me a lot as well, by the way. I should I should throw that out there. Uh, so the later middle months, middle fellowship part two, hopefully by this time, if you're working like a well-oiled machine. Uh, this, these are a bit of the doldrums where you're you're saying, oh, man, this fellowship, I, I could have been attending for six months, seven months already. Um, um, but but at the same time, I. I through that and still to this day I feel like I'm learning tons and tons of stuff every single day so it's, it's very worth it but you want you know your, your your patient care to be to be very succinct at this point uh appropriately succinct at this point um so that you can then spend the rest of your time continuing to learn uh this is that during this uh, portion of fellowship is when I signed my job and then ending fellowship so uh because I'm neuro we, we end a little bit earlier uh, than some of the ortho people not to throw that out in your face or whatever sorry apologies but it's I'm, I'm actually it's, it is what it is uh but this is where I am so I'm still again still figuring this out uh I I, I know what I think about is I, I want to keep my energy going I don't want to burn any bridges I, I I've worked very you know diligently all year to try and keep keep my relationship strong and I don't want to ruin it at the end um, I, I completely agree. Uh, determine what experiences you've not yet had, what cases you haven't seen, uh, and what is, what you need to succeed in the future. And that's kind of a theme of, of everything I've been saying is 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 uh, figure out how to make things work for you while, while obviously taking appropriate patient care. Um, just to throw this out there, license, licensing and credentialing takes forever. It is terrible. Start that earlier than I did, maybe before this portion. Um, if you once as soon as you get a job, really just keep this nail that um, and uh, figuring out how to take the things with you that you need. I, and I, I can't say it better than Taryn did already, but uh, but talking to the OR staff and getting the the, the um, tray lists, uh, you know, how do you how do you take all of these little minutia kind of that you're learning throughout your fellowship with you? Um, that is something that you that really hits home right at the end here. Um, so I, I've been really focusing on that, and I would I would advise doing that as well. And then a couple uh, scattered pieces of advice that I have. So uh, as has been said a few times, prep before, review after. After every um, every big case, not not the little bit ones, but um, every big case, especially if plastics is closing. A uh, fair amount of the people from the OR, so the fellow, the resident, Dr. Shuba, um, Dr. Lowe, if he's there, some the reps go as well, will go down to the cafeteria and sit, uh, sit there, have a bag of chips. It literally just did this about 45 minutes ago. And it's it seems a little crazy because you just went through it, but you talk about the case again for another half an hour, 45 minutes and, and debrief. Did we do this right? Did we do this wrong? Did we, how could we have done this better? Even if it, Even if it turned out perfectly, could we have done this part better? Um, and I, I have found those little, like sessions, whatever you want to call them, extraordinarily helpful. Um, and so if you get a chance with your fellowship director or, or fellowship, uh, any of your attendings, I mean, to, to debrief, I think that is incredibly helpful. Um, you, you want to make as many relationships as possible by going to conferences. Uh, so not only your mentors, but others in your field. So again, the AO conference at Banff was fantastic. I met some people that I'm on the forever and you see faces uh, again and again. Um, as has been said, meeting prior fellows is very helpful. You might end up doing a, a global spine on, on navigating fellowship shortly thereafter. Um, uh, go to as many as conferences as possible, meet people. It helps you. I think it helps you really to focus your research or maybe broaden. It always gives can give you new ideas. Um, if you can go look at as many posters and listen to as many talks as possible. Um, I think one of the more important things I'll say as well is don't say no, but sometimes say no uh, if it's appropriate. So. So if you get an opportunity to do something and you can do it, definitely take every opportunity you can. But uh, the second half of that is don't take on something and then not and then you, you know you, you can't do it uh, because you're overwhelmed and you've said yes to too many things. Um, uh, pick the right things for you. Um, and then finally, 
you're going to, everybody has to just kind of figure out their own practice. Uh, for me, it's definitely going to be a mix of my, men my mentors here uh, at Northwell, but also it will, without saying um, in my residency, we, but without saying that we, uh, I, I probably will use quite a few of the things that I learned back then um, as well. So uh, I, I hope, uh, you know, I hope to kind of build my practice uh, as an amalgam of everybody I've, I've met, you know. And uh, hopefully this was, oh, it's not supposed to say TP. Hopefully this was helpful, um, but that's my, my scattered advice. Well, that was outstanding. I, I wonder how many uh, spine surgeons in the world uh, still eat chips uh, after their case because of uh, Shuba. Uh, <laughs> he gets two bags of cheese popcorn. <laughs> cheese popcorn. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, as, as Scott's sitting up here, certainly seems to be a theme emerging, which is uh, be nice to people. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, even here, so uh, when I was at Hopkins, uh, Justin Sachs uh, closed a lot of our big cases for us, plastic surgeon. And uh, there was a time when I was talking to my job, I would hang after a little bit usually and, and help and try to learn from those guys. And, um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, you know, long story short is he would ask me where I was going uh, job wise, and he was always pumping up Wash U. And uh, it turns out uh, that he was also coming to Wash U to, to take the position as the uh, chief of the division here in plastics. So it's been a lot of fun having him here. But yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's an amazingly small world, uh, and it's amazing how 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 connected we are uh, as we move on in our careers. Uh, so so really nice job. Thanks thanks for doing that. Uh, I will uh, so we don't run out of time. I will let uh, uh, Dr. Nimmons uh, take us home here. I think. Great. Well well thank you so much, Dr. Goodwin, and and thank you to the other two presenters. You did a great job and. I echo all your sentiments. So I've been tasked this evening to kind of comment on the last six months or so. I finished up my fellowship in Wash U, um, I guess it was August 1st, and moved to North Carolina where, I, where I've been practicing in, in Winston-Salem, home of the Demon Deacons and Joe Camel. So lots of uh, <laughs> big culture of tobacco abuse here in town. <laughs> so... Let's see. So just a little bit about myself. Grew up in Houston, go Astros, world champions, medical school, Texas A&M, Giga Maggies, and uh, did my residency in Baylor. And I actually saw one of my dear mentors on the call this evening. So shout out to Dr. Burchuk. You're a big reason I went into spine. So appreciate that. And then did my spine surgery fellowship at, at Wash U. You know, and I think I brought this page on just because I think during the training process, we become trainees. We are spine surgeons. That's a big part of our focus. And I think that's very important. And, you know, it's certainly something to be very proud of. But I think what I have found over the course of the last six months is I have been able to reignite passions and interests that maybe I had neglected. And, you know, I love my two sons. There's pictures of them right there. But you know, certainly haven't been able to spend as much time over the course of the last five, six years with them as I would have liked. And, you know, I chose deliberately a context that would allow me to have more time with them and a lot more time for my passion. So been able to do some baking, see, you know, Mary Berry over there and watch the Gunners every Saturday whenever they're playing in the Premier League. So I think, you know, as you know, wherever you are you in your training process or wherever you are in this process, I think you know, there's certainly something to look forward to. And, and I've really enjoyed the last six months. It's been very stressful, but it's been great. So I think as I see it, you know, positioning yourself as, a, as an attending, I think there are several factors to consider. And this is not a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination, but these are some things that I, I thought about bringing up. So when you're trying to think about wh what the next step is for you, I think it's very important to think about the community that you're looking to join, whether that's proximity to family, whether that's looking for a certain support network, whether that's a faith tradition that has strong roots in that community. I think that's certainly something to consider as you're, as you're deciding where to go next. <laughs> and I put it in bold because it may be the most important thing. It probably should be number one is where does your partner want to go? If you have a spouse, if you have a significant other, if you have a long-term partner, they've been supporting you through this entire process in a lot of, in a lot of cases. And I think, you know, certainly their opinion and their, their input you know, as, 
has a big impact. And that certainly was, was the case in, in my, my situation. You know, whether they're geographical implications, whether you're looking for academic opportunities, you know, the neat thing is that over the course of the last few years, it seems like there's different variations of that traditional model. And I think that's something to consider whenever you're looking for a new job, the type of practice, the type of cases you're looking to do, uh, what, you know, the relationships you have with your groups and partners, you know, I think as a fellow or even as a chief resident in Taryn's case, you know, you go on these visits and it's very easy to get along with somebody for a weekend, but you know, you kind of have to take things at face value and delve a little deeper, you know, oftentimes. And I think that relationship, you know, sort of, sort of those relationships will be commented on as far as mentorships and things. I think a different dynamic can present itself in, in practice. And I think that's an important thing to consider as well. And then certainly the economics are, are a factor. So, you know, when I say family support and community, what do I mean? Are there other things besides the job that can bring you into this context? You know, when we moved to Winston-Salem, speaking from my own situation, you know, we had family here. You know, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law got two young nephews in the community here. And that was a big factor why it even put us put it on its radar in the first place. You know, the decision and the conversation that my wife and I had is, you know, what if they moved away? Would we still be happy here? And I think that's a, that's an important consideration. If whatever it is that's bringing you there, what happens if that changed? Would you still be happy? And I think that's an interesting thought experiment as you're trying to plot your next move. Is if there's only one thing bringing you there, you know, is that connection? Is that is that enough? And it might be. So whatever you're interested in, will you be able to cultivate that interest? Let's say you're into mountain biking or hiking in the mountains. Moving to the Gulf Coast of Texas isn't going to get you that, right? It's not going to let you follow that, uh, you know. So I think it's important to think about that, you know, if you're looking to, uh, you know, do some advocacy or some political engagement as part of your, as part of your career, you know, being around a capital or you know DC or something like that might be something worth doing. So all to say is I think there's something to say for the community you're joining. And then when times are challenging, are there people you can turn to? You know, when I think about this. I think of people outside the medical context, but of course you're going to turn to your partners, you're going to turn to your mentors, but what about your faith leaders or what about your neighbors? You know, if you're heading out of town or you're staying late, can you call on your neighbor to let your dog out, do things like that, you know, and that seems like a small thing, but that's the type of thing that I think really builds connection and allows you to build and cultivate deep roots in a community. You know, again, I underscore this and really, where does your partner want to go? It probably surpasses all the other things, because I think that's, that's hard to trump. So anywhere in the globe. <laughs> and then geographical, I think, you know, breaking down the United States, I think there were some, some pretty funny maps that I, I found on the internet. Um, a lot of them had Texas being its own region, which I, you know, made me chuckle a little bit being from the, the Lone Star State. But, you know, geography, I think, has some, has some implications to how you're going to practice. I think, you know, in certain situations, the standard of care perhaps is a little different. You know, there are maybe places where something is commonplace and common practice where other parts of the country, that's not necessarily how things are done. It's neither right or wrong, but, you know, I think that's something to appreciate when you're going into a situation. I think there's also medical legal implications. Uh, I think perhaps less so in spine than there are in, in other medical fields, perhaps. Um, but, you know, you could see that there could be some potential medical legal implications as far as your, your breadth of practice, maybe relationships with APPs, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, those sorts of things. Those all have implications about where you settle in the country. Certifications and licensing. I think Dr. Peters mentioned that, that can be a headache, but, you know, I think that's something to think about as well as how onerous that process might be. And then interinstitutional collaboration. If one if envisions yourself being a, a researcher and, and an academic physician, then it might be beneficial for one to go to the Northeast United States, for instance, where there are perhaps multiple medical schools, multiple institutions within a very small radius. So, you know, being able to cultivate those relationships and develop that might be something to consider. And as I mentioned, standards of practice, there was one job I was looking at where they didn't seem to do very many inpatient cases, even things that in my training as a resident and in my training as a fellow would have given me pause. And you know, ultimately I didn't end up choosing that job because I just felt very uncomfortable. You know, it turns out there was a physician owned facility and there was a lot of pressure to do these outpatient cases, but 
you know, I think going to a community where other people are doing things differently than you, I think is, is probably fine, but it's something to understand and appreciate. And then the practice setting, rural setting, urban setting, resources, the healthcare system. You know, and I think one of the, one of the other jobs I was looking at was an academic job in you know, a state in the deep South. And I was going to be the academic spine surgeon for the entire state. There were other spine surgeons there, but they were all private practice. And that was something that was interesting to think about as being someone fresh out of fellowship. Is that something I'm prepared to take on? Because you know, there was no one else that was in that position. So, you know, I think on one hand, it was exciting. And the, certainly the, the service side and the, the, the altruism was there. But I just didn't think that was necessarily the best thing for me starting out, not having that kind of support. So, you know, something to think about. Academic opportunities. I think I made mention of this earlier is, you know, there's a traditional academic model, which I tried to capture here with this picture with all the medical students and fellows and residents and everything else. But, you know, in my residency, there was a private academic model where a lot of the faculty had volunteered and to be affiliated with the medical school and the, the residency programs. And I think there's something to say for that because they seem to have a very good pulse on the business side of medicine, billing, coding, you know, and they, they had a lot of insight into how that dynamic works you know, and they also did a lot of the complicated cases because it was also a level one trauma center so i think you know there's a really interesting opportunities there if one wants to teach if one wants to do research to find models where it can suit your professional goals both in terms of your clinical style and your clinical approach but also maybe developing some of this mentorship and some of this teaching sides and then of course there's hospital practice whether one's hospital employed, healthcare system employed. And I, I can't begin to think that, you know, I have all the answers in that regard, but, you know, I think that's something to think about and certainly talk to your mentors about when you're, when you're considering job opportunities. And then the type of practice that one wants to be, you know, I think one of the reasons I came here is because there's not a lot of spine deformity surgeons in, in town. You know, you go to the Scoliosis Research Society website, and there's only a handful of people in the entire state of North Carolina. So, you know, I really wanted to develop spinal deformity, and but also wanted to do cervical cases because I enjoy those cases a lot too. But you know, I think being able to have an idea of what your type of practice is and what kind of cases you enjoy the most, you know, how subspecialized you want to be, I think factors into the, the decision-making process too. And then this was a really important thing for me, you know, and, and aside from, you know, the community setting and the, you know, where my partner wants to go setting, I think the setup of the group you're joining, I think is, is really important. And I've heard over and over again from two or three of my partners, I've got six partners where I'm currently working. A lot of them are neurosurgeons. Only one other one is orthopedic spine trained, but over and over again, I've heard that's what we're here for, right? I got a I got, a, I got an incidental durotomy the other day and it was devastating. I was able to fix it, was, it was all fine. But my partner came in because at our institution, we don't have any trainees. So it's a lot of the time, it's a surgical tech that's doing the first assist. So when I got into the incidental durotomy, it was nice to be able to call in my partner who was in the other room. He came in, helped, me, helped follow me while I was sewing up the dura and you know went out. And later on, I was talking to him and he just kept saying, that's what we're here for. And, I just started board collections earlier this week. So, you know, again and again, however I can support you during this time. I know this is stressful and I'm going to stay out of your hair, but, you know, and I think that's something to think about and think, you know, how comfortable are you going to be? Because I think there's such tremendous growth that happens in the first year. That's, I've heard that over and over and over again. You know, despite all the preparation fellowship, despite all of the uh, bringing the tools along with you and, you know, you trust in your training, but it's, there's still a lot to be learned in your, your own style and everything else. And, and I think your partners in the practice and then in the group, I think go a long way to kind of help refining that a little bit. And then there's the economics of it, you know, and perhaps this is maybe the most, most practical part and least abstract part of my talk, but the economic side was something I was very uncomfortable with as it came with contracts, as it came with deadlines, people trying to pressure you to sign letters of intent and all these sorts of things just made me very, very uncomfortable. I think 
I tend to be a pretty non-confrontational person. And for whatever reason, that's how I took a lot of these, these interactions. And don't think it necessarily has to be that way. I ultimately decided to get some professional advice and outsource a lot of the headache. So what I found, and this is, I can't underscore this enough. I found that an attorney that can help you review documents, help you review contracts, invaluable. I can say that my contract paid for itself tenfold what I paid for the attorney, just based on their input and their guidance. So, and I've heard of other situations where someone ended up being in a very bad situation for call responsibility, not getting compensation for it because they did not get it reviewed. So I, I can't underscore that enough. I think having someone review your contract is, is critical, especially if they have an appreciation of the local context. You know, the person I worked with in particular was from North Carolina and I didn't know anybody in North Carolina, really certainly not in the medical profession. And they had a very good appreciation of what's typical for such and such position, you know, and then when it came time for me asking for certain things, they, you know, she would come back and say, well, they don't typically offer this. No one gets this, but maybe we could ask for this instead. So I think having someone that has a local knowledge and appreciable knowledge and does it from is familiar with that and does the sorts of negotiations over and over again, I think is really helpful too. And the nice thing about it too is you can negotiate. They can have you can have them negotiate on your behalf, so you're not the one that's coming back and forth. That was part of the very uncomfortable. So they're the one coming over back and forth on your behalf with the other legal team. So it, it's nice. Um, other things I'd say is you know make sure you get clarification or any oral agreements in writing, even if it's sent in an email or something like that. See if you can get that included into the, the language of the contract. And, you know, make sure you clarify call coverage. You know, like I said, there was a, a mentor of mine who ended up in a bad situation because he took for granted that he was going to be compensated for his, for his call coverage, which was significant. And uh, it turned out that it was, according to the contract, it was lumped into his, his guarantee. So in any case, it's, I'll say it again, it's worth having someone that does it all the time, a professional to do it. I don't know if we have time, Dr. Gubin. I put together a little case presentation, but I, I can also, we can also end here, whatever you think's best. Um, we are out of time, but may, may, uh, depending on how involved the case is, I might have you do it quickly in 60 seconds without. Yeah, uh, I can do it. Uh, you can just tell us the answer. Also, yeah. I want, just want to point out, having operated with you, I'm confident you didn't need any help with that, Deuteronomy. Uh, <laughs> but but I do think you are you are one of the best at kind of your being very, very good, but also having that humility to to get opinions and say, what do you think of this? And, and it's just, that's, you, have said you, you, were, oh, you were good at that as a fellow and it's a skill that's gonna, uh, will continue to serve you well, I think, just that uh, that combination. But yeah, why don't, you, why don't you quickly go through it and we won't uh, yeah. answer questions. We'll just- uh, Sure, for sure. So, so this is a lady in her 60s that I tried to, to kind of depersonalize it a little bit, but she came in, um, came in from one of my senior partners, actually. Uh, you know, you want to take a look at this? Yes, the answer is yes. So has osteopenia, has a T-score of 1.4, had a previous thoracolumbar lumbar fusion somewhere in Alabama for a quote-unquote deformity performed in 2007. She was doing fine up until about three years ago. And then over the course of the last three years, she's been having severe back pain, had some residual left lower extremity radicular pain, kind of in this L5 distribution. Unfortunately, over the course of the last four weeks, she's had multiple ED visits secondary to these pain flares. She also has some, you know, some subtle weakness, four out of five EHL uh, peroneal muscles, and then some weakness in the foot and some diminished sensation in the foot. So this is what she presented in. She's very flat, right? She's got kind of an iatrogenic flat back deformity, but she's also got, you can see it, there's this tremendous vacuum disc phenomena and facet arthropathy at the L5 S1 disc. So there's this long fusion construct that does not have spinal pelvic fixation. And you know, lo and behold, she's broken down at the only mobile disc down at down at the L5 S1 disc. So here, you know, this, I, I brought this in to illustrate that I still plan my surgical cases the way that I did as a fellow. And um there's a myelogram. She couldn't, she has a pacemaker, unfortunately, but she's got us with this huge disc herniation, vacuum disc on the CT myelogram that, you know, I think in large part was contributing to her, her complaints. So, you know, doing my preoperative planning, 
unfortunately, she didn't agree. She did not want a PSO. She did not want to be extended up to T4. She wanted the smallest operation that would still give her benefit. So, you know, I'll get to that point in a minute. But the way I saw it is this lady probably would benefit from a PSO or at least multiple Smith-Peterson osteotomies to the lumbar spine. But at the very least, what I tried to do is my plan was to get a hyperlordotic lumbar cage at L5-S1, get her at least 20 degrees of lordosis through that segment, whereas she did not have any previously, do, some, do a Smith-Peterson osteotomy in the segment there. But because of how ankylosed and interdigitated her facets were at L5-S1, I felt like I needed to do a posterior, anterior, posterior procedure. So we did this in a two-staged approach. So the first day did the lumbar decompression, did the posterior column osteotomies and complete facetectomies at L5-S1. And man, they were huge. <laughs> so tried to get the landmarks normal, got the PCOs out, was able to, to get some mobility there, closed her up, put it on a wound vac, came back the next day with our vascular colleagues, put in a big hyperlordotic cage and flipped her back over and then re-instrumented and completed the uh, the pedicle subtraction osteotomy compressed across the lordotic segment. Um, is it perfect? No. Am I happy with the amount of lordosis doses we got across that segment? Yes. And within the constraints that she was unwilling to have some of these larger procedures, we counseled her about the risk of PJK and everything else. But um, I think it went overall very well. And, you know, my, my, I don't know if this may be anecdotal, but I think the fact that she did not PJK previously, the fact that we've improved her alignment a little bit, um, and she was, you know, she hadn't PJK'd in those those proximal segments above, you know, hopefully gives me a little bit of hope. But main takeaways so far in six months in practice, continue to plan each case with PowerPoint, software of choice, surgeon map, because to me, I can't imagine showing up in the operating room without that degree of preparation. I would just, I would feel so insecure and um, it's like my security blanket, right? So I still do that. And I, I anticipate that I'll continue to do that for a long time to come. Maintain contacts send cases for review mentors and partners you trust. I contact one of our other fellows. We engage each other, you know, almost on a daily basis, talk to people from WashU, talk to other people. Uh, even talk to Dr. Birchuk, who's on the call. Uh, one note, I've got kind of a running note of things that have come across and things that I look up in journal articles and highlight. And, you know, one thing I've learned so far is that they don't seem to read the doctor's book. You can tell them that they benefit from a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, but they're just not interested. So, you know, and then sometimes they present in ways that are not according to the textbook either. You know, lumbar stenosis doesn't always present the same way. And, and that's, been an interesting challenge, um, but a rewarding one. It's, it's certainly why a lot of us went into spine is to do that problem solving side. And then, you know, I won't hash that, but the individual preferences is important. Be willing to learn from your partners. You know, I think there's a couple of techniques here, one in particular where, you know, the posterior column osteotomy technique that one of my partners here does that I really like. So I've been trying to incorporate that a little bit more. And, you know, six months in, you know, kind of tying it all together is a hard way to make a living what we've chosen to do, but it is very rewarding. I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity, grateful to my mentors and grateful to the profession. Well, as expected, Scott, that was fantastic. And I want to thank our, um, for the sake of time, since we're a little over, I want to thank our, our three uh, uh, panelists for joining us. Uh, really uh, outstanding. I've gotten a few uh, text messages about you guys as well. Really a nice talk and, um, such such a you know similar but different perspectives from all three of you, um, you know the uh, um, I love Scott you pointing out the thing about uh, your family uh, that is something to keep in mind that your whole life you're like told what to do and as a fellow your time is really not your own and you're told be here be there etc and it's like for the first time you start to get to arrange some of that yourself and it's a little bit shocking when you're like oh I can set this up so. I can make this game or I can coach this team or whatever it is. Uh, but that's certainly uh, such a, such a huge thing to consider. So um, uh, again, I want to thank you, uh, you all for presenting uh, uh, really impressive and uh, great. I could listen to each of you for an hour individually, I think. Um, and I want to thank everyone who attended and uh, look forward to, to seeing everyone next week. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin.